And at this time, I'm going to turn the podium over. Um, I'm so happy today to have uh, Narsana Premachandra with us. She's the president of Dances of India, and she's going to uh, take a look at the connections between the philosophies of Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., and also give us some uh, moments to sort of reflect and think on that and how it's relevant to our lives today. And I'm so pleased she could be here. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Narsana Premachandra. Thank you, Emily. It's so lovely to be here. This is um, my first time speaking in the Missouri History Museum. And as Emily mentioned, um, I'm president of Dances of India. It's a company that was started by my parents um, in the 70s. <coughs> Excuse me. And my mom is the artistic director. And my um, dad um, was a huge, huge supporter of the arts. He was a scientist. But uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. So after he passed away, I took over the administrative stuff as well. So um, I always think it's a, it's a challenge to do both the left and right brain parts of a company, but I'm so, so grateful to be able to do that. So this is our 40th season in town. And, um, and I've spoken a little bit about Indian culture around town in different places, the art museum. And, um, and so I'm delighted to be able to talk to you today about um, Martin Luther King, and how he was influenced by Gandhi. And um, I hope you'll see along the way that um, I, I, there were some surprises that I found in my research. So I tried to bring you more uh, lesser known facts, so um, rather than the big cliche ones everyone knows, but rather lesser known facts. So hopefully we'll have an interesting journey um, this afternoon. <laughs> so um, what Emily and I uh, thought we'd do is, you may have been, you may have, um, receive the note cards and pens as you enter. And if so, this, this is to um, just write your thoughts down on a couple of concepts that I'm going to introduce, um, just to think about these concepts and how they relate to your life um, and how perhaps we can bring them to, into being into the contemporary world. I'd, I'd like to say that talking about, uh, sorry, researching nonviolence has been such a wonderful wonderful occupation for me um, in these past few weeks because um, the world we live in is so can be so bewildering and so harsh and to read about two men who not simply practice nonviolent who not simply um, talked about nonviolence but who actually devoted their lives to bringing it into being in this world it was ex extraordinary so um, our first slide here is um, full effort is full victory Gandhi, King, and the Persistent Path to Peace. Uh, full effort is full victory, is um, saying of Gandhi's that um, action, uh, take, taking action is, is victory. So this is the first concept I wanted to talk about. Um, when I was reading the works of Gandhi and King, I kept coming across the concepts of ahimsa in Gandhi and agape in King. So. Ahimsa is a Sanskrit word that means nonviolence. Um, himsa is to strike or to injure, and a uh, removes that. So it removes all harm, all injury from something. And it's a concept that was developed in the Indian texts from about 500 BC. It becomes central to a lot of the ways of Indian thought. And I should say also um, Jainism, um, Buddhism as well. It's very, very important. So Gandhi said, um, no man has ever been able to describe God fully. The same is true of Ahimsa. So if you can think about what nonviolence means, it's for Gandhi, it wasn't just simply, uh, you know, not to kill someone or not to injure someone, but it had to be an aspect of being in all areas of your life, in the way you, the way you think, not just the way you speak, but the way you think, because thoughts, thoughts have weight. Thoughts are important. Um, the neuroscientists all say thoughts are actually physical. They're not simply ephemeral things, but actually physical. And of course, the whole idea of your consciousness, the mystery of consciousness, of course, is also another concept which is um, included in the idea of ahimsa. So to not harm. So, um, so yeah. So that's an important concept 
to keep in mind as we talk about Gandhi's influence on uh, Dr. King. Um, oh, and I will say, so how Gandhi, um, one of the reasons Gandhi had these ideas of nonviolence is when he was, um, he was born into a merchant family um, on the west coast of India, and, um, and they were all quite religious, and so his mother would, would undertake fasts, and, um, and, they, and they did something uh, quite curious. If one of them was mad at someone else, they didn't strike out at the other member of the family, but they would uh, do an inner penance to show them they were upset. So once, Gandhi had um, a friend who people think was, was Muslim, and he wanted to invite him over to dinner. But in the late 19th century, that would have gone against the caste rules, so his friend couldn't come over to dinner. Well, he was so upset, but he didn't take it out against his parents. Instead, he denied himself one of his greatest pleasures, which was eating mangoes. Um, and he, he did not have the mangoes that season to show his parents how upset he was. And apparently that was, um, that was a theme that, that ran through his family's life, the idea of self-suffering. Um, and also, there were a lot of Jain monks. Uh, Jainism was very prevalent in the area. So Jain monks used to visit their homes. For those of you who may, who may not be familiar with Jainism and Jains, um, this is, this is a religion that was born in India around the, I think, 6th century BC. Um, the stories of the founder have some similarities to the stories of Buddhism. And in Jainism, ahimsa, to not harm, is really, really um, significant, is really important, very, very important. Historically, Orthodox Jains, when they would walk, they would brush the ground in front of them, so no... Uh, so they're not killing any insects or any germs as they walked. So that's how central ahimsa is to um, Jainism. So that's a little story from Gandhi's childhood. And let's see, go to the next one. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes of his, which is not as well known, I, I think. But if we remain nonviolent, hatred will die as everything does from disuse. Um, and I, I really love that. It reinforces the idea that if you, if you are resentful against something, you keep being resentful and keep being angry. It's just reinforced in your mind so much that it becomes a part of you without you even realizing it. Um, there's a word in Sanskrit. It's called sam samskara, and it's this idea of a repeated pattern of thought and behavior. And then it's so a part of you, you're not even realizing it. So the idea is to release that, to let it go, um, and then it, it will die on its own because you're not paying it any attention. So it's a very practical way to think of hatred, I think. Let's see. And in King, so Dr. King talked about agape, which um, I learned in my, um, my Greek history class at WashU. And it's a Greek term for universal goodwill. And in Dr. King's words, it is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. It is a type of love that stands at the center of the movement we are trying to carry on in the Southland, agape. So for those of you who may not, who, um, may not remember or may not have learned, in um, the ancient Greeks, uh, distinguished love as three different types. There's eros, which is aesthetic and romantic love. Philia, which is love that is reciprocated, love between friends. And finally, the greatest of all loves, agape. I used to have a professor um, at Washington University, professor of classics, who, from whom I first learned about this concept, and he was a World War II vet, and he died a couple of years ago. But when he talked about it, he had stars in his eyes. So it's a beautiful, beautiful concept. And this term appears over and over in Dr. King's writings, so it's, it's really lovely. So as we go on with the presentation, we can think about these ideas of ahimsa, nonviolence, refusing to harm anyone, even in your thought, and agape, which is universal goodwill, universal love. It's, it's disinterested love. You, you, you don't love someone for, for yourself, it's for, it's for their sakes, and for the community as a whole, which is really important. Dr. King stressed that. So 
it's so important to restore the community. So let's see. Oh, and here's a, oh, and here's a quote by Dr. King on Gandhi. It must be emphasized that nonviolent resistance is not a method for cowards. It does resist. If one uses this method because he is afraid of or because he lacks the instruments of violence, he is not truly nonviolent. This is why Gandhi often said that if cowardice is the only alternative to violence, it is better to fight. And um, I really love that in case there's some you know, misunderstanding of what nonviolence is. It's not hiding in your room and avoiding the world, even though that's very tempting to do sometimes. But, <laughs> but it's um, actually um, going out and then taking action and taking action for the, for the greater good. Gandhi himself said, by the way, as this is quite interesting as we read Gandhi's progression, in his autobiography, he's written, I was a coward. I used to be haunted by fear of thieves, ghosts, and serpents. Darkness was a terror to me. I used to be very shy and avoided all company. My books and my lessons were my sole companions. I literally ran back from school because I could not bear to talk to anybody. So that's Gandhi on his own childhood. Some commentators think he's exaggerating that even at a young age, he was pretty, he, he, had, a, he had fire in him, but, but um, that's what he has written about himself. So, so that is um, a beautiful definition of um, what nonviolent resistance is. And here we go. So this is Gandhi. So um, in 1888, Gandhi went to, to London actually to study law. And when he was in uh, London, he was actually quite a fashionable young man. He, um, he apparently went to Bond Street and bought fine suits in um, Bond Street. And um, he studied French, he studied dancing, he studied music. And, um, but his music teacher told him, quite frankly, to kind of give it up on trying to be a fashionable man. So, so he, he heard that pretty young. Um, but um, this is him. So after, after his studies in London, he went back to India, but he wasn't, um, he didn't really make it, he wasn't very successful in India as a lawyer. And um, he went, then he went to South Africa. And in, um, in South Africa, he just, it was kind of a lowly, low level job. He was just helping a, a merchant, an Indian merchant in South Africa. But this is the famous incident that um, changed his whole, his whole life. So on June 7th, 1893, he, was, he had bought a first class ticket from Durban in South Africa to N Natal. And um, so, so the journey started and then um, a white passenger entered the compartment and he was shocked to see a colored man in the compartment. And he asked Gandhi, um, well, he asked him, um, you know, why are you here? And Gandhi said, well, I have, a, I have a first class ticket. And so the man went back and got a porter and the porter told Gandhi he had to go to the freight car. So Gandhi, of course, refused. And then the porter got a police official and um, Gandhi refused and he was thrown off the train with his baggage in um, Peter Maritzburg, South Africa. And there is a plaque which leads, which reads in the um, train station. In the vicinity of this plaque, M.K. Gandhi was evicted from a first class compartment on the night of June 7th, 1893. This incident changed the course of his life. He took up the fight against racial oppression. His active nonviolence started from that day. And interestingly enough, a similar incident happened um, to Martin Luther King, which I wasn't aware of. But when, um, in an interview, uh, King was asked, um, when did his racial, the consciousness really awaken on how he, he was, on how his race was treated? Um, and he said when he was 14 years old, he went from Atlanta, Georgia to Dublin um, to participate in a contest with the Negro Elks. Um, and he had written an essay called Negro, The Negro and the Constitution, and he won. And he went with his teacher, Mrs. Bradley, and they took a bus. And on the way back, they boarded the bus back to Atlanta. And um, then some white passengers got on the bus. The bus was full. And the teacher told him, we have to stand up. And he was very angry. He didn't want to stand up. He refused initially. 
But the teacher told him, look, I mean, just stand up. It's just not worth the trouble. So his teacher and himself stood up, and they stood up for 90, the 90 miles to Atlanta. So that's um, the first incident where it really occurred to him the injustice that was being done to his race. And interestingly enough, the first incident where he was thrust into the national spotlight was, of course, in 1955 with the Montgomery, Montgomery bus boycott. So it all involved trains and buses for uh, both men to really awaken their consciousness. Um, let's see what the next slide is. Oh, okay. So I want to talk a little bit about South Africa because this is where Gandhi first got his, um, got his bearing. So in 1906, there was an um, um, Asiatic Registration Act where all, a, all Indians and Chinese, all male Indians and Chinese had to register. So there was resistance. And at this time, he led... Um, let me see if it's in the next slide. Oh, okay, this slide, sorry. Um, this time, it was at this time he developed the key concept of, um, one of the key concepts of his struggle, which is Satyagraha. So Satyagraha is, Satya is truth, and Graha is to hold on firmly. So for Gandhi, truth, I mean, truth is God, right? Truth is your soul. So it became truth force or soul force. So Satyagraha involved um, um, non-cooperation, protests, civil disobedience, but absolutely no violence. And um, another key concept he developed was called Swaraj, or self-rule or home rule. This was really important for him. He struggled with the idea, actually, um, you know, before he ever realized he would become a leader of the Indian independence movement. I mean, this, this was not even in his mind, in, you know, in the beginning. But he, as he was thinking about all this, he realized, how can you, how can you um, rule your country if you cannot rule yourself? So these were key ideas in his thinking. Um, this is why when sometimes when protests turn violent, he would fast. It was this idea of purity, like he was not pure enough to continue Satyagraha and um, Swaraj. Um, and here, I just thought I'd give you a little glimpse, just a tiny glimpse into Indian dance. So um, classical Indian dance was uh, created about over 2,000 years ago. And one of the main reasons it was created is because, um, is because it was a vehicle to transmit stories and ideas to, uh, to a populace who really was not literate. I mean, only the priestly class could read. So the great Hindu stories and all this were transmitted through dance. So in, and when you see something in dance, it really comes alive. It comes alive in a way that is different from reading about it or hearing about it because someone else is bringing it alive. So I just wanted to show you in dance how we would show Satyagraha. And by the way, in Indian dance, the hand movements are very important, as well as the expressions and the feet, too. So this is Satya. Satya. Graha. And then Swaraj is Swa, which is the self, to rule. And then Ahimsa, nonviolence, is like this. Like this, it's a little bit hard behind a podium, but that's the that's the idea you get of how we transmit these concepts um, through through dance. So um, that's your intro to Indian dance, classical Indian dance. So, and it also it's hard to dance because I'm wearing boots and we have to wear and we dance barefoot actually. So, um, so um, yeah. So now I want to talk about South um, South Africa knowing those concepts. So in um, 18, I'm sorry, in 1906, he, um, he, led, um, he led the Satyagraha against the Asiatic Registration Act. And the reason I mention that is because it was the first time he was jailed in 1906. Um, and then in 1913, and then in uh, 1913, um, South Africa came up with an, another act, which decided that all non-Christian marriages were invalid. So overnight, you know, his marriage is invalid, Muslim marriages are invalid. So Gandhi's wife 
did Satyagraha to protest and she was arrested. And then Gandhi led a historic march um, from Wolf Street in, in what was then um, South Africa to um, Transvaal. And in that march, so many people joined him and it also caused so much resentment from, from the native South Africans. But um, he, was, he was arrested again. And um, he actually mentioned when he was, he was arrested that time, there was, it was a magistrate who was sent to arrest him. And he said, um, it seems I have been promoted since magistrates take the trouble to, to arrest me. <laughs> so not just mere police officers. So, um, and the reason I mentioned that incident is because when he did come out of jail, that was it for, for Western dress. He dressed himself in a white cap, a white tunic, and a white, um, like a long white cloth that uh, Indian men traditionally wear. So those were two very seminal incidents in his life in South Africa. And they did come to an agreement and, and the non-Christian marriages were valid and everything was eventually worked out. But these pictures I wanted to show you because I wanted to show you his, um, um, his progression in, in his fashion. Most people, when they think of Gandhi, they think of the man in the loincloth. But it didn't happen overnight. I mean, <laughs> he didn't decide to suddenly wear a loincloth one day. So that first picture I showed you where he was in a suit, that was a very fine-looking Gandhi. He used to spend 10 minutes a day combing his hair, actually. And, um, and then, um, now this is in the upper corner there. That is um, him. Not a, lot of, not a lot, lot of people know this, but he volunteered in the Indian Ambulance Corps in the, in the Boer War and in the Zulu Rebellion. And, you know, he was still loyal to Britain at this time. Um, and, um, but the Zulu Rebellion really, really changed his eyes and changed his thinking because it was so brutal. It was so brutal. The, um, which if you read descriptions of, descriptions of it, it's really, really awful how awful the British were to the, to the Zulu, to the native Zulu members. And um, he said, it's, this is not a war, this is a manhunt. And it changed his ways of thinking about race. Um, it just enlarged his whole view. Because perhaps he wasn't as sensitive to Africans in the beginning as he should have been. Um, N Nelson Mandela has written this, actually, how he, uh, his consciousness enlarged. It grew. I mean, it really grew at that time. Um, in the, in the 1915, there is Gandhi and his wife. Um, this is when they returned to India after... Um, after their time in South Africa. And in India, they were really uh, well, well received um, because they had done so much for um, Indians in, um, in South Africa. And there's a story that he was invited to a fancy party and he and his wife were very plainly dressed, you know, like that. Everyone else was, you know, all, um, had a lot of bling and was blitzed up. And um, they actually gave him gifts of gold, which he auctioned on the spot. So, so yeah, that's um, so he was very, uh, very, very honest, for sure. Okay, all right, and now we come to the Indian in, um, Indian independence movement. So um, these are just three seminal moments I picked out just to show um, his ideas of nonviolence and um, satyagraha. Um, so this is the first one. It's an incident that I did not know about actually at all, and it happened uh, in 1917 in Champaran. This is an obscure district in um, India's poorest state, which is Bihar. And um, so one day a farmer came to him from Bihar pleading with him because, because at that time the British landlords were forcing their Indian tenants to grow indigo. There was a high demand for indigo in England at the time for, um, for a for the text for their for the fashion I should say so these peasants were being forced to grow indigo and not grow food so there was famine so um, Gandhi didn't know who this man was he didn't even know about all this but he did go to Bihar and um, when he saw the situation he got actively involved and he um, there was mass civil disobedience and um, and then he was he, he was jailed and, but there was such an outcry that they did, that they did, excuse me, they did uh, release him. And that was the incident where, for the first time, he was called Bapu, or father. And, um, 
there was a, a British official who did say that not a chest of indigo reaches England without being stained with human blood. So after Gandhi went, um, farmers did receive more compensation and, and more rights. So that was a huge success for him. It got him more involved in, um, in Indian independence. The next incident, um, you may have seen uh, Jalanwala Bagh. If you saw the movie Gandhi, you, you may have seen it in there. But in the northern Indian state of Punjab, in um, Amritsar, there was a Hindu and Muslim leader. They were both, um, they were both um, ex um, expelled from Punjab because of because um, they were causing unrest, and the British government was uh, was uh, worried, you know, about about the unrest they were causing. They were calling for Hindu-Muslim unity against England, so they were expelled. So the populace was pretty uh, pretty upset, and there were some reprisal killings. But then what happened, to calm the situation down, um, a new lieutenant general was br brought in, um, Reginald Dyer. And so this is, this is what happened. He went around the city proclaiming that um, there can be no more public demonstrations. And, but the problem is he didn't go all around every single part of the city. And this is, the, you know, this is an era before texting before you can uh, let someone know, you know, you, you got to leave, you know, no more demonstrations. So, but he didn't go around the whole city. So, a group on, I think April 13th, I think it was, a group of, um, a group of people gathered together in the bog, which is a garden. And this was a narrow square. It was circled by houses. There were very narrow, I'm sorry, it's a square that was in, um, there were houses all around and very narrow entrances into the square. So people gathered. At the same time, it happened to be a Sikh festival. So people were talking nonviolently about, about how unfair it was that these two leaders had been, had been um, um, expelled from Punjab. But there was also a celebration. It was a, Sikh, it was a Sikh holiday, Sikh festival. And then what happened when Lieutenant General Dyer heard about this, um, he arrived with his men. He gave no warning whatsoever, and he started shooting. And they sh they they were shooting for maximum to for maximum impact. So um, between 500 to 1,000 people were killed. It's I'm not sure of the exact amount, but this was so. Uh, when I say I'm not sure of the exact amount, there there are different sources. That's why. Um, but this was a huge. Um, this was something huge in the um, Indian independence movement, and Gandhi fasted. And then um, a lot really, really began to change after that. Um, and um, Nehru, uh, Nehru's father, Nehru, the first prime minister of India, his father started, um, who was very, they were very wealthy and wore the European suits and all that. Nehru, um, his father no longer wore European suits. It was all in, in back to Indian clothing. So that was a huge um, incident. And then of course, the third is the, the great salt march which I'm sure, I'm sure some of you have heard, but in um, 1930, all of a sudden, the tax on salt went up 2,400%, and um, Britain declared that Indians could not, be, Indians had to buy salt from Britain, they couldn't create their own, so he went on, he started the salt march. They um, walked 241 miles, it took uh, three weeks. He started with 79 followers and ended up with tens of thousands. So I think Adam, in the next scene, I think Adam's going to play, I found this one minute clip of it, I thought was quite amazing.
So at the end there, that's, that's salt on the beach. And the British actually had tried their best to clear the beach of salt. And, but the, apparently the sea didn't listen to the British because the sea did, uh, did leave some salt there, which he picked up. That's him picking up salt at the end, which is a hugely sim symbolic victory. Um, so, so, and in that, I love to see all the... It's incredible to me how many thousands joined him. This reminds me of an, of an idea in Dr. King's work where he talks about um, cosmic companionship. And he's talking more about how if you do something in, um, on the side of justice, how the universe will help you. It's a natural law. And, um, and it, but to me, I, I also find that um, very, uh, I, I find that very um, apparent in a march like this. And so this is why I would like to transition next to this. So this is the march from Selma to Montgomery in 1965. And um, this too was incredible, it lasted four days. Um, he started off with 2,000 people and in Selma and in Montgomery, he ended up with, um, there were 50,000 people who um, met him in Montgomery. So um, I, I just, it's hard for me to imagine, I think, Perhaps what's lacking nowadays is when we talk about nonviolence. Well, first of all, I don't, I personally don't hear a lot about nonviolence in the national discourse nowadays, and um, and the nonviolence requires so much persistence. I mean, in, in in the salt march that lasted three weeks, you know, not only Gandhi got blisters, his followers got blisters, and his followers ended up some of them ended up riding a um, like a a cart, um, and they offered a a cart to Gandhi, but, but he, he refused. He walked the whole way. And this, you know, to think about in 1965, this took four days to walk from Selma to Montgomery. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine something lasting four days of just, of, of just refusing to stop and continuing to me. That is just in, incredible. I think one thing we've kind of lost nowadays is that persistence and that, that it doesn't matter how long it takes, but to keep keep at something, to keep at something, and to believe in those ideals. So, um, so um, yes, yeah, so this was this. Let me go to the, let me go to the next slide. Oh, and um, Adam, can you play the clip on Gandhi? So this is Gandhi talking, uh, sorry, King talking about Gandhi. Gandhi? Where did you come to Gandhi? I came to Gandhi in the same setting, in theological seminar days, I had heard of Gandhi, but I remembered hearing a message by the president of Howard University, Dr. Mordecai Johnson, who had just returned from India. He spoke in Philadelphia on his trip to India and the whole philosophy of Gandhi and uh, passive and nonviolent resistance. I was so deeply moved by the message that I went away and bought several books on the Gandhian, uh, on Gandhi and Gandhian texts. And at that point, I became deeply influenced by Gandhi, never realizing that um, I would live in a situation where it would be useful in me. And actually used it in, actually would apply it in the yes. country. I must admit, I did not realize um, how deeply Dr. King was influenced by Gandhi. I, I honestly thought it was more of a, I mean, I mean some, like someone he had, he had heard about. Excuse me. Someone he had heard about, but, but I, I just didn't realize how deeply he studied Gandhi. Um, there's a quote here um, in, um, in one of his essays called Pilgrimage to Nonviolence. And he says, when he's, thinking about, thinking about um, different theological issues and all this, he says, I had, almost despaired of, I had almost despaired of the power of love in solving social problems. The turn the other cheek philosophy and the love your enemies philosophy are only valid, I felt, when individuals are in conflict with other individuals. When racial groups and nations are in conflict, a more, sorry, when individuals are in conflict with other individuals. When racial groups and nations are in conflict, a more realistic approach is necessary. Then I came upon the life and teachings of, of Mahatma Gandhi. As I read his works, I became deeply fascinated by his campaigns of nonviolent resistance. 
the whole Gandhian concept of Satyagraha, Satya is truth which equals love, and Graha is force. Satyagraha thus means truth force or love force, was profoundly significant to me. So to me, that really shows how much Gandhi, um, Gandhi influenced him, much, much more than, um, than, than, than I realized. So. Yes, and then in um, 1959, um, Dr. King went to India, and he was, um, he was roundly welcomed. I mean, he had um, huge audiences, um, people, he had um, autograph seekers, and um, as you can see, after he passed away, um, the Indian government created a stamp for him. And so, um, let's see, let me go to the next slide, one second. Yeah, so after Gandhi was, so, you know, Dr., uh, Dr., I'm uh, sorry, Gandhi was assassinated in 1948. So Dr. King never met, never met Gandhi. But these are his words on his passing, which I think are just so prophetic, I mean, about his own passing. Many years ago, when Abraham Lincoln was shot, and incidentally, he was shot for the same reason that Mahatma Gandhi was shot for, namely, for committing the crime of wanting to heal the wounds of a divided nation. And when he was shot, Secretary Stanton stood by the dead body of the great leader and said these words, now he belongs to the ages. And in a real sense, we can say the same thing about Mahatma Gandhi, and even in stronger terms. Now he belongs to the ages. And if this age is to survive, it must follow the way of love and nonviolence that he so nobly illustrated in his life. And Mahatma Gandhi may well be God's appeal to his generation. For in a day when Sputniks and explorers dash through outer space and guided ballistic missiles are carving highways of death through the stratosphere, no nation can win a war. Today, we no longer have a choice between violence and nonviolence. It is either nonviolence or non-existence. So I think that's a, that's a really, really great quote. So Dr. King took a lot of his principles to heart. When he was, um, during the um, Montgomery bus, bus boycott, his house was, um, was, was firebombed. And, um, and after he went back, he went back to see that his daughter and his wife were okay. And then thousands of African Americans gathered at his door. Um, they wanted to, you know, take, uh, take revenge for his sake. And he said very clearly, he said, if you have weapons, take them home. If you do not have them, please do not seek to get them. We can't solve this problem through retaliatory violence. We must meet violence with nonviolence. And to me, that's so moving. And the idea, especially nowadays, when I think of what's going on in the news and in the world, to hear such powerful, strong words about nonviolence and love, it's, um, well, it's very, very moving. Um, so, yeah, so, and, um, and Dr. King also talked about, when he talked about nonviolence, he said that um, some of the some of the qualities that make nonviolence so important are the fact that it's passive physically, but it's active spiritually. And when you and when you're when you're nonviolent, you are not you arise a sense of shame in your opponent. It's when you when you create um, when you take boycotts or do civil disobedience, but it's not to humiliate them. It's to show them that the is to show them the injustice of their actions, not of, not of their own. So never to call a person individual, but that the forces, never to call a person evil, but the forces around him can be evil. So um, he said one of his most beautiful quotes is, along the way of life, someone must have sense enough and morality enough to cut off the chain of hate. So, and then this is, I thought this was very, very quaint. This is a, um, in uh, 1963 in Birmingham when there were, um, when there were protest movements, nonviolent protest movements to, um, um, to ensure that um, African Americans were treated properly in, in stores and in schools, the volunteers had to fill out a commitment card, which is really quite um, uh, remarkable, the whole idea of filling out a commitment card, something you're really, really, um, that you're really uh, dedicated to. Um, well, I thought it was very, very quaint. Um, 
and talking about, uh, of course, from, from his pers perspective, uh, the Christian perspective, and um, sacrifice personal wishes in order that all men might be free. It's really, really beautiful, I think, to have, to have request, to have had individuals um, require them to read all this and to sign it as a sign of their commitment to the movement. They didn't just take people lightly. So, and then, oh yeah, this is, I thought, um, so this is in his letter from Birmingham jail in uh, 1963. So after the protests in Birmingham, there were some white church leaders who, who wrote to him and who thought that he was unwise and untimely in, um, in causing such civil disobedience and causing these nonviolent protests. And he, when he was in jail, he was in jail for 11 days, and he wrote, it's beautiful, it's a letter from Birmingham jail. If you haven't read it, it's lovely. I had not, I had not read it. And so there is um, a passage in there that's just beautiful that I just thought I should read. Perhaps it is easy for those who have, never, who have never felt the stinking darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly feel your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television, and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children, and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in a little mental sky, and see her beginning to distort a personality by developing an unconscious bitterness towards white people, when you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is acting, who is asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored. When your first name becomes nigger, your middle name becomes boy, however old you are and your last name becomes John, and your wife and mother are never given the respect to title Mrs. When you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance <coughs> runs over, and men are lo no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you will understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. So I think this is a gorgeous, gorgeous piece, piece of writing. And that's why I thought I wanted to um, end, um, end the presentation with um, another passage from letter from Birmingham jail, which, uh, you know, he wrote in jail. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities and in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. So if he can write something that beautiful in jail, I feel that, I feel, you know, any of us, if we're in those moments where we feel we're in our kind of self-imposed, self-imposed prisons, we can certainly write, we can certainly act and lift ourselves above in despair. So, um, and um, so, yeah, so this is, this is, sort of gives you an idea of how um, Gandhi, I'm sorry, Dr. King was influenced by Gandhi. Um, so, um, yeah, do we have any, I'd love to take if are there are any questions or any uh, comments on uh, anything I brought up, or do you have any ideas on ahimsa or uh, nonviolence or um, just any of the ideas, satyagraha? Are there any kinds of questions or anything? Yes? Um, when Dr. Martin Luther King uh -huh. interviewed, uh -huh. he said, uh, I like this passive and nonviolent movement. Uh -huh. I, um, and I heard you say that it wasn't passive to be, uh, to be following Ahimsa. So mm -hmm. what did he mean at that time? Um, I think uh, uh, my guess would be that he was talking about... Uh, he said, I like 
I, I think to, to that effect, that passive, nonviolent moment that's called a hinge. And so I was wondering, because earlier Nasima had said uh, that it wasn't passive. I think so we we do uh, you know um, do something about this. So I wanted to know what MLK meant when that my guess is he meant passive as opposed to being violent, actually, in the sense that, I mean, this is my, my reading on it, the, um, the idea of not actually, um, not retaliating in anger, but in taking civil disobedience to, maybe to, I mean, he, he talked about creating tension. He talked about creating tension in, um, in communities to bring the, to bring the injustice to the to the fore to the fore so people can't just ignore it. So it's in the in fact he talks about um, in here there's actually another great quote I thought um, where he says nonviolent direct nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. So it's not being violent in any sense, but it's, it is creating a tension nonviolently to bring the issue to the fore. Almost like saying that it won't let the other side be passive about what we're doing. Yes, yeah, that's a, that's a very good way, right, right. In fact, he goes on, and this sentence I, I did want to bring up in the presentation because because I find it so interesting. He says, my citing the creation of tension as part of the work of a nonviolent resistor may sound rather shocking, but I must confess I'm not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension which is necessary for growth. Yeah. It's almost that tension that's needed. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh -huh. Make it less, um, you know, more fair. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. To not just sweep it under the rug, but to really, to really bring it to the front. Yes. Any other questions or ideas on Ahimsa? I um to give you some more time to think. I I wanted to tell you a couple of little incidents from Gandhi's life that I did not know about. Um, he could be very humorous. Um, <clears throat> after the great after the great salt march, um, he was staying in a reed hut, and then um, one morning a flashlight shone upon him, and he opened his eyes, and there was a policeman, and he said, "Are you coming to arrest me?" And the policeman said, "Yes," and he said, "Well, may I clean my teeth first? And <laughs> so he went to clean his teeth, and then, and then he was arrested. But um, this, this, he, he had a, a lot of humor um, along the way. When Winston, Winston Churchill very, very famously called him a half-naked fakir, and a fakir is a, is a, um, is, yeah, is a, is a, is a holy man. And he said, and um, it took him 13 years to craft the response. <laughs> he did you know, in this age of tweeting, when everyone's tweeting one another immediately, um, Gandhi actually did write Churchill 13 years after he called him a half-naked fakir. And I think one reason is because they wanted, he wanted to work with Churchill as, they, as it was clear that India was achieving in independence. Um, so in, in 1944, he wrote a letter to Churchill, um, Dear Prime Minister, you are reported to have the desire to crush the naked fakir as you are said to have described me. I have been long trying to be a fakir and that naked, a more difficult task. <laughs> I, therefore, I therefore regard the expression as a compliment, though unintended. I, I approach you then as such and ask you to trust and use me for the sake of your people and mine and through them, through those of the world, your sincere friend, M.K. Gandhi. But um, by then, I think Churchill was already out of office, I think, or by the time it got to him, I should say. Excuse me. And this is something very interesting. I learned that Gandhi wrote to um, Hitler. Did any of you know that? Yeah, I, I, I didn't know. I, um, I mean, I often, you know, I 
I've often, when you think about that period, um, that era in time, you think, my goodness, you had, you had Hitler, you had Stalin, you know, then you had Gandhi. I mean, the just the opposing forces in the universe, it's sort of mind, mind-boggling at times. You had Einstein in that era. Um, but I never knew that Gandhi actually wrote to Hitler. Um, the first letter he wrote was in 1939. It never got to him because, um, because Britain actually censored it and it never got to Hitler. But he said, Dear friend, friends have been urging me to write to you for the sake of humanity, but I have resisted the request because of the feeling that any letter from me would be an impertinence. Something tells me that I must not calculate and that I must make my appeal for whatever it may be worth. It is quite clear that you are today the one person in the world who can prevent a war which may reduce humanity to the savage state. Must you pay that price for an object, objective, however worthy it may appear to you to be? Will you listen to the appeal of one who has deliberately shunned the method of war, not without considerable success? Anyway, I anticipate your forgiveness if I have, if I have erred in writing to you. So I remain your sincere friend, M.K. Gandhi. But then, um, so that letter never got to Hitler, but then in 1941, on Christmas Eve, he wrote him a long public letter. And in this he says um, that I address you a friend is no formality, I own no foes. Further, we resist the British imperialism no less than Nazism. And he wrote, in nonviolent technique, there is no such thing as defeat. It is do or die without killing or hurting. But Gandhi never got a reply to this, so because Hitler was busy doing other things. So, <laughs> so yeah. So those are some of the interesting things I learned in my, in, in my research. So any other ideas about Ahimsa or Agape? Or how do you think um, Gandhi and Martin Luther King would, how, how would they react to the world of today? I mean, you, do, you think, do you think they would tweet? I mean, I mean, quite seriously, I don't, um, you know, because, because, I mean, the king writes so beautifully. I mean, his writings are so beautiful, and you, you can't imagine them as a tweet. But they were very practical men. I mean, you know, very, very practical about the reality of the situation and how to bring about nonviolence. So perhaps they would. So any ideas? Anyone, any ideas or thoughts or? I just had a comment. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. Uh -huh. that dance and music was a way to communicate to the elites or to the past. Yes, yes. Now it seems like technocrats are the ones that are taking a message yeah. to the people, mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily, uh, you know, it's called fake news, whatever, but uh, it's not a balanced way. So if you can mm -hmm. use technology, Twitter and all that to get people together in a balanced way, Mm -hmm. I think I see a way in that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to reach as many people because mm -hmm. whatever we are going through is not localized. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, as yeah. spring, everything mm -hmm. has the same idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think technology, if it's used appropriately, mm -hmm. is going to be the key thing. I mm -hmm. suppose I could be totally biased. No, that make that makes sense. I mean, that's why. I mean, that's why I do say that Gandhi and King were so practical. That I think if they had been alive today, I think they would have used some medium like that. And that's what I'm saying too. Let's say, yeah, yeah, no, no. That I and you can still keep music, dance, and everything, uh -huh. and you know, use this medium mm -hmm. to get the communication out there. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yes. Uh, what was Um, he, um, well, he studied law in, um, in England. Um, I forget, you know, I've read that part and I forgot the, Madison. does anyone know? Was it a, hmm? Madison law. Yeah, he was, it was a degree in law, but I forgot which college he studied in. Was it? I, it was, it was in, it was in London though, I think. I, I cannot, I cannot remember the, 
I'm sorry, I can't remember the name. But yeah, he was he 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 was a barrister. He did practice law and Yes? Mm-hmm. If you look at the death sort of, uh, uh, in a way it's a uh, 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 rather interesting because uh-huh. Gandhi's assassination mm-hmm. uh, by uh, what's it? Uh-huh. is exactly the text that in, in, in a yearly sense uh-huh. happens because the, at uh-huh. the time when the, uh, the practice of non-violence is very all, all very good, mm-hmm. we have uh, the time of independence when there is uh, uh, Hindus are being, uh, being slaughtered and so on and so right, forth. Right. To preach Northland at the time of intense pain and suffering, mm-hmm. it just did not go very well. And this is a couple of endurance more mm-hmm. flowing. Mm-hmm. It's in a way, sort of ironically, mm-hmm. <laughs> twisted in this, uh, but uh, it's just a fate for Gandhi. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why, I mean, like, like I read when I was reading about the um, Montgomery bus boycott and how Gandhi's house, I mean, sorry, King's house was was firebombed. And then he told he, the people who wanted to, to take revenge on his behalf, he told them to, to leave, drop your weapons. And they said that was very significant. When, in the articles I read, that was very significant because in the Watts riots that happened nine years later, once it turned violent, it turned sympathy against, against the rioters. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, the ideas are fascinating to read, to think about, like, you know, when violence is just and when it's not, and the idea of bringing real nonviolence into this world, it's, um, yeah. It's so there's mm-hmm. a real moral conflict that uh, mm-hmm. uh, we faced during the time of independence. Mm-hmm. This is, uh, there's uh-huh. this, uh, historically, too, I mean, it's not the first time, many, mm-hmm. many times. The, uh, so when do you actually have to, uh, 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 this is nonviolence, uh, uh, a powerful thing. Mm-hmm. That, that model uh, conflict has always been there, especially in this Right, absolutely right, right. And I should say, I didn't go into the details of Indian, um, the actual Indian independence and all that because it gets very complicated and it's very, it's, uh, it gets really complicated. But there were those who did not agree with Gandhi about, about nonviolence, absolutely, in India, which also led to partition and the, the great tragedy of partition. Any other questions or ideas or anything? Yes? Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh, so um, so for those of you who may not heard the question, is like, how did they incorporate Dr. King and Gandhi incorporate nonviolence into their? everyday acts. And that was very important for Gandhi, by the way, the idea of nonviolence. It, you can't just be nonviolent one day and then, and you know, another day um, be mean or cruel or, or anything. It doesn't make sense. It has to be whole. It has to be a part of your whole life. And so, um, I mean, Gandhi would do things like um, undertake fast if, or if, or um, if he if, if he believed that he had not something was not going right and he had, he had not acted properly he was very honest about all his failings um ab- ab- about his weaknesses i mean incredibly honest that's one thing about gandhi that you may not like aspects about him but he was very very honest uh, from what i have read he would engage in meditation in the morning um, um he really believed in this idea of being pure to your task. During the salt march, as I mentioned, people asked him, do you want a card or do you want to rest? He said, no, 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 we can do this. And, and you know, they walked 241 miles. So, um, so yeah, he would, um, he would meditate. He would, um, his diet was very sparse, very simple. Um, some, it was like goat cheese and olive oil and lemons and, you know, not wanting to harm. Um, he was vegetarian. Um, so... I'm trying to think of anything else that sticks out immediately as to part of his. Um, you know, uh, earlier you said uh, oh, yes, something uh-huh. about changing one's thought process. Yes, uh huh. And that is a key thing. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Behavioral change. Uh huh. Oh, absolutely. Uh-huh. And the psychologist will tell you that. Mm-hmm. And I think Gandhi was a shrewd uh, thinker because mm-hmm. that is the key. You know, changing your thought process will induce a consistency mm-hmm. in your. That's true. 
That's that that is true. It is changing your thought process and being very aware and alert of everything, of every thought you have, and being open to changing your thought processes. Processes about Dr. King. I'm not as sure about his daily behaviors. That is something I did not look into. But from what I have read, he gave deep thought into all the ideas um, from Christianity. If he, of course, comes from a Christian perspective. So, and it was a book called Christ in India about Gandhi that brought him to Gandhi. That was when he first heard about him. So you can read his thoughts and his development of his thoughts to incorporate East and West and um, the idea of cosmic companionship. He says, even if for those who don't believe in, in a personal God, if, or if you believe in um, Brahman, which is the Hindu idea of the impersonal God, or those who, um, there is this idea that the universe will work with you if you're working towards something just. So, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know enough about Dr. King's daily activities. That's a good question. One thing I know <laughs> is he did struggle with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this idea whether, you know, he was meeting people's needs. And I think he tried to commit suicide once. Uh, I, I know I've taught uh, personality uh -huh. theories and we look at uh, his history. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And he got over all of that. Mm -hmm. Building the cell. It was a key thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he did have problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other ideas or thoughts or anything? Or anyone? No? All right. Well, I guess I'll um, close this presentation with it's a, a quote from Gandhi, which is so. Um, so common that I, I, I felt no need to, to put it on a, on a slide because it's, you can see it on mugs, you can see it on calendars, you can see it on, but it's um, um, be the change you wish, you wish to see in the world, so, which, is, which is great, which I think is also great for a new year, so yeah. Well, so thank you, thank you so very much for coming, for your ideas for coming out in the cold. Thank you so much.